Greetings to all. I am Dr. Susie Rose, and as the Senior Vice Dean for Medical Education, it is my proud honor to open these proceedings and pronounce that the commencement exercises of the Raymond and Ruth Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, recognizing and honoring the graduates of the class of 2020, will now begin. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you all virtually, including our trustees, Dean and Executive Vice President for the Health System, Dr. Larry Jamison, our commencement speaker, Dr. Katrina Armstrong, the class of 1970 speaker, Dr. Elliot Yolis, members of our 50th reunion class, the class of 1970, our class of 2020 student speaker, Dr. Alana Nelson Greenberg, the entire class of 2020, virtual guests, faculty, parents, children, relatives, significant others, and friends. We realize that this is not the celebration you had planned for, but we do celebrate with great enthusiasm as you, the class of 2020, have reached this wonderful milestone. You have worked so hard to get here with many joys and successes and some more challenging times, supported by your own resilience, and that has been tested no greater than in the past couple of months, but also supported by the power of those who love you. This is a commencement, a beginning, in a difficult time, but what we expect will transition to a magical journey for you over many years to come. This is a powerful point of transition, and it is only right to pause and celebrate your achievements and reflect on your successes and accomplishments. We are exceptionally proud of each and every one of you and applaud your ideals, commitment, and talents. So please, enjoy this moment. Cherish your sense of pride in yourself, your family, your school. Many of you are staying at Penn, but others are leaving. We hope you will always look upon our school as your launching pad and as a source of professional development, knowledge, and support. On behalf of the faculty, I extend hearty congratulations to you, our graduates, and to those who love and support you. I now introduce our Executive Vice President and Dean, Larry Jamison. Thank you, Dr. Rose. Good morning, everyone. I'm Larry Jamison, Dean of the Perlman School of Medicine. It's great to be with you today, even virtually. Graduates, this is still your day, and we're here to celebrate you the class of 2020. To say that your commencement is different is, of course, a huge understatement. Certainly, I miss the opportunity and the togetherness of a traditional graduation ceremony, but gathering this way is a mark of our resolve to be resilient until the end of this pandemic. Rarely has a graduation ceremony been more significant or more essential. Commencement remains a beginning and a time of joy and our focus is firmly fixed on the medical knowledge and skills you have acquired and will use for decades to come. There are many people to recognize for bringing you to this point in your career. This recognition begins with our faculty, the professors, the clinicians, and the scientists who have been role models and mentors sharing their wealth of knowledge and their values of humanism and professionalism. Many of, us, many of them have joined us online to demonstrate their support, and I thank them for that. This group also includes the trustees of Penn and Penn Medicine and other leaders whose service to the school is invaluable. I want to recognize some of them online with us today. David Cohen, Andy Heyer, Walter and Ann Gamble, Barry Jordan, Robert Johnson, Kevin Mahoney, and John Epstein. Thank you for all you do to support our graduates and the mission of Penn Medicine. Your families, spouses, partners, and friends have made sacrifices to get you to this point. For their support, I'm sure you're deeply grateful. So please turn to those who are with you now and acknowledge their support, along with the support of those who could not be with you physically today. To reach this milestone, you've worked extraordinarily hard met every challenge we've set before you and amazed us with your accomplishments. We're proud of each of you. Congratulations to all of you. 
This is a moment of great change and transition. Even in extraordinary times, it is bittersweet. Many of you will be moving away to a new city with the added challenges of physical distancing. And as you begin internships in the next month, the learning curve will be steep, but also incredibly exciting and invigorating as you hone your skills and begin your lives as doctors. Penn has prepared you well for this new responsibility. You have proven your ability to acquire the knowledge and skills to serve as outstanding physicians. While the pandemic has been swift and frightening, it has also afforded you an opportunity to reflect on what matters most to you, what kind of doctor you want to be, and what kind of impact you want to have. You have chosen the medical profession because it is a calling to serve as well as a profession. In this respect, the pandemic has revealed your character and I couldn't be prouder of the way you have run towards this crisis. You have responded with urgency, resourcefulness, and resilience. Staffing our telemedicine hotlines, working with the EICU, staffing the CHOP COVID call center, working with the Penn Medicine Center for Healthcare Innovation to create an artificial intelligence chatbot for patient questions about COVID, helping our hospitals find personal protective equipment and other essential supplies, shopping for groceries, volunteering, and countless other ways to support the people of Penn Medicine, the patients and the communities we serve. You have come together in this crisis and will be different doctors, better doctors than you otherwise might have been, stronger, more resourceful, and better prepared to address the urgent needs of our communities and more appreciative of teamwork and quicker to look out for one another. You're becoming doctors at an exciting time for medicine. The tools we have for discovery, diagnosis, and treatment have never been more powerful. As you enter the medical field and practice, the use of imaging, minimally invasive surgery, new medicines, informatics, and artificial intelligence will allow you to make diagnoses earlier and treat diseases with ever-increasing precision and better outcomes. These advances make our health system one of the best in the world. However, the pandemic has shined a harsh light on the ways that the health of our society falls short of our expectations. The fragility of our public health system, the racial and socioeconomic health disparities that have been starkly exposed in the midst of this outbreak, particularly with respect to the high death rates of our black and Hispanic communities. The crisis is illuminating a better path for the future of medicine, one that places more emphasis on prevention, access and equity, and has a more robust and innovative public health infrastructure that expands telemedicine and uses technology to engage patients more actively in their care, and applies cutting edge sequencing technology and informatics to spread the development of new therapies and vaccines. You benefit from the training you have received at the Perlman School of Medicine, but also from the diversity and wide ranging life experiences that each of you brought here. These are tremendous strengths. As you join the healthcare workforce, we're confident that you will elevate your impact. At Penn Medicine, we're accustomed to taking the long view. Our medical school was founded in 1765 as the first in the United States. Our graduates have answered the call to service throughout our nation's history, from outbreaks of yellow fever at the time of the American Revolution, to the Spanish flu in 1918, and the coronavirus pandemic today. Soon you will be hearing from the class of 1970, marking its 50th reunion. I would like to thank Dr. Elliot Yolas for all of his support. Ordinarily, he would be joined by many members of his class. While they could not be with us today, I want to thank them for their engagement and generosity over the years. Today's graduates could not find better role models than our 50-year alumni. They never stopped learning, and over the decades, they have adapted to the enormous changes in our profession. You will have to do the same over the course of your careers, perhaps even more so as the creation of new biomedical knowledge and the accompanying pace of change continue to accelerate. I know you're anxious to begin this next exciting phase of your career. The Perlman School of Medicine has prepared you extraordinarily well, not only to save lives in this crisis, 
but to lead throughout your medical careers. We're very proud of you and we look forward to your impact. It is now my privilege to introduce today's graduation speaker, an international leader in academic medicine and an expert in studies of health disparities, medical decision making, and cancer prevention. Dr. Katrina Armstrong is chair of the Department of Medicine and physician in chief at the Massachusetts General Hospital, where she also serves as the Jackson Professor of Clinical Medicine at the Harvard Medical School. I'm proud to say that she was a distinguished member of the Penn faculty and a Penn medicine leader for many years. Dr. Armstrong is a graduate of Yale and the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. She was a resident and a chief resident in medicine at Johns Hopkins and completed a research fellowship and masters of science in clinical epidemiology at Penn. In 1998, she joined the Penn faculty and led a research program in cancer control. Over the years, Dr. Armstrong took on multiple leadership roles, including serving as the Associate Director of the Abramson Cancer Center, Co-Director of the Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Program, and Chief of the Division of General Internal Medicine. In recognition of her impact, she is an elected member of the American Society of Clinical Investigation, the Association of American Physicians, and the National Academy of Medicine. Among other awards, she has received the Outstanding Junior Investigator of the Year Award from the Society of General Internal Medicine, the Outstanding Investigator Award from the American Federation of Medical Research, and the ha Alice Hirsch Award from Academy Health. In addition to her career in health policy and disparities research, Dr. Armstrong is a dedicated practicing internist. Over her career, she has prioritized her role as an educator including developing and leading courses on clinical decision making at Penn and at the MGH. She has created multiple innovative educational programs, including the master's program in health policy research at Penn and the Center for Educational Innovation and Scholarship at Mass General. Diversity and inclusion are central to Dr. Armstrong's leadership, including her award-winning roles in the advancement of women her commitment to programs to support diversity across faculty and trainees at the MGH, and her research leadership in health disparities and community-based research. These are extraordinary accomplishments, and it's my distinct honor and pleasure to welcome Dr. Katrina Armstrong to our ceremony. Katrina. Thank you. I am delighted to be a part of this incredible day of celebration. I wanna congratulate Dean Jameson, Dean Rose, and the rest of the Perlman School of Medicine leadership on this innovative online ceremony, on their unwavering dedication to your medical education, and on their exceptional leadership at this time of national crisis. I have never been more proud to be part of the Penn family. Of course, I also wanna congratulate you, the class of 2020 and your family, friends, and colleagues who have walked this journey with you. This is a graduation that will be written into the history books. Some of that history will be about what we are missing. We're missing being together in person today to celebrate your achievements. Across the globe, people are missing spending time with their family and friends, sending their children to school, Many are missing a job, a paycheck, and most importantly, more and more are missing a loved one who has been lost to COVID-19. But even as we recognize and honor those losses today, I have no doubt that this medical school graduation, the graduation of 2020, will be remembered first and foremost, not for what we have lost, but for what we have been given, the chance to begin and to begin again. For your class, it is the chance to begin your career at a time of national crisis when your humanity and your skills have never been more needed. For medicine, it is the chance to begin again as a field, to begin a new era for medicine, to define what medicine can do for our patients our communities and our society. 
what it means to be a doctor today. Even though it has been almost 30 years since I stood in your shoes, I have strong memories of medical school. Some of those memories are concrete, even visceral, memories of rooms and people and smells. But my strongest memories are of feelings, this combination of fear, excitement, and humility when I first walked into a room to take a history from a sick patient, the growing anticipation that I am sure you all are feeling now of when I would be the doctor, not a student doctor anymore. But my deepest feelings was a growing sense of awe, awe about what it means to join a profession that is dedicated to serving others. As you will say in the oath later today, to dedicate our lives to the service of humanity. Medical school was also when I began to understand that this profession united in its goal of serving humanity, often approached that goal from two parallel worlds. Of course, I now know that this medical dualism has been recognized for centuries. And the descriptions, of course, have varied across time and setting. Sometimes it's called the art and science of medicine, sometimes the worlds of mind and body, sometimes the power of data and the power of stories, increasingly the biological and social determinants of health. In the end, all of these words are seeking to describe a fundamental truth, the truth that both disease and circumstance matter, or to paraphrase William Osler, we must both know what sort of patient has a disease and what sort of a disease a patient has. We know here today, as you stand graduating and becoming a doctor, that the health of our patients is driven both by the behavior of molecules and by the behavior of humans, driven both by biology and by society. Nothing, of course, could have brought that truth home more clearly than the experience of the last months. While the SARS-CoV-2 infection would not exist without the COVID-19 virus, there is no doubt that the impact of that virus on our patients and our communities has been driven by social forces, particularly the long-standing structural inequities across racial and ethnic groups in the US. In Boston, our hardest hit community, Chelsea, became a hotspot, not because of a change in virus biology, but because it is impossible to self-quarantine when you have no food and eight people live in a one-room apartment. One of the greatest accomplishments of the last 70 years has been our ability, the medical profession's ability, to change fundamental human biology. We now target proteins to change their function, turn on and off the immune system, reprogram cells to create miniature organs, remove parts of the body that are causing disease and replace them sometimes with man-made new parts. We have harnessed scientific advances to prevent illness, cure disease, and relieve suffering far beyond anything that I could have imagined when I stood in your shoes almost 30 years ago. Unfortunately, the same story cannot be told for the other world in which we live. In fact, paradoxically over the last decades, we have become a profession that believes that we can transform fundamental human biology, but are relatively helpless against social forces incapable of changing the man-made social structures that drive health. A profession that believes we can edit specific genes and specific tissues to prevent heart disease, but cannot provide high quality healthcare for all. That we can redirect immune responses to cure metastatic cancer, but cannot ensure that our patients can afford their medications that we can grow an organ in a dish, but cannot address racism in healthcare, that we can replace heart valves or even an entire aorta when needed, 
but cannot provide mental health care to those in need. Honestly, this has never made sense to me. How can we feel so empowered to take on fundamental biology, but so disempowered when faced with the human and social processes that we ourselves created? At least those were the two worlds that we lived in until the last several months, until the COVID-19 pandemic, until the year of your medical school graduation. Because we have seen over the last months that in fact, we can take on these processes. In the matter of weeks, we have transformed the healthcare system. We created hospitals and parking lots and shut down practices that we did not need. We turned orthopedic surgeons and internists and primary care nurses into critical care experts. We brought medical care to patients wherever they needed it, using whatever modality that we needed. We trained new skills overnight using Zoom and some well-curated handouts. But perhaps most importantly, we came together. We came together across disciplines, across countries, and across institutions that have competed for generations. We did it because it was right, it was needed, and it was what a doctor should do. Although there are many stories of courage and commitment that will be told about the pandemic, none are more inspiring to me than how medical students have risen to this challenge. You and your colleagues have volunteered to track patients across settings, to staff hotlines and pagers, to develop new tools to support healthcare workers, to provide support for vulnerable populations, including food and quarantine supplies. These stories are important to me, not only because what, have, what you have contributed to the COVID-19 epidemic, but because of what it says about you, the graduating class of 2020. It says that you understand that we can do much more than we thought. Yes, we can edit genes. Yes, we can target proteins. Yes, we can turn on and off the immune system. But you also know that we can get patients the care that they need. We can work across a city to take care of our most vulnerable populations. We can stand up housing for those who have nowhere else to recover. Yes, we can do what is needed and what is right. As inspired as I am about what has been accomplished over the last months, I know that this is just a beginning and that the path ahead will not be easy. There have been many, many years of believing that such changes were out of our reach. There are deep structural issues and perverse incentives. The complexity of healthcare comprehensive health care for all is far greater than even the most complicated response to COVID-19. We have our work cut out for us. Today, you graduate from the nation's first medical school. For well over 250 years, the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine, now called the Perelman School of Medicine, has led this country in defining medical education defining what it means to be a doctor. You should be incredibly proud. It is now your turn to take up this mantle, to build upon what you have learned over the last years and what you have seen and accomplished over the last months, to lead our country in service to our patients, our communities, and yes, to humanity using and creating every tool that is needed. Because after all, that is what a doctor does. Congratulations and Godspeed. Good morning. I'm Horace DeLisser, Associate Dean for Diversity and Inclusion. I would first like to thank Dr. Armstrong for those very inspiring and very timely words. Each year, we recognize outstanding teaching here at the Perelman School of Medicine. 
I'm therefore truly honored to present the very deserving award-winning faculty to you now. The Leonard Berwick Memorial Teaching Award for fusing basic science and clinical medicine teaching, Divya Shah, MD, MME. The Blockley Osler Award, Nadia Bennett, MD, MS, ED. The Dean's Award for Excellence in Basic Science Training, Rodney Kamar, PhD. The Dean's Award for Excellence in Clinical Teaching at an Affiliated Hospital, Cesar Briseño, MD, Michael Hogarty, MD, Kristen Light, MD, and Victoria Wirth, MD. The Dean's Award for Excellence in Clinical Teaching by House Staff, Albert Yu, MD. The Dean's Award for Excellence in Medical Student Teaching by an Allied Health Professional, Jacqueline Hudak, PhD. The DRIPS Award for Excellence in Graduate Medical Education, Margaret Bailson, MD, MPH. The Christian R. and Mary F. Lindbach Distinguished Teaching Awards, Judy Shea, Ph.D., and Autumn Feaster, Ph.D. The Scott Mackler Award for Excellence in Substance Abuse Teaching, David Weiss, M.D. The Medical Student Government Teaching Awards, Nadia Bennett, M.D., for Clinical Teaching, and Robert Doms, M.D., for Basic Science Teaching. And finally, the Leonard Tao Humanism in Medicine Award presented by the Arnold P. Gold Foundation, Nala Kalik, MD. Congratulations to these outstanding faculty members. Thank you, Dr. DeLisser. My name is Dennis DeLugos, and I am the Associate Dean for UME Science and Discovery Curriculum. It is my honor to introduce the 50th year speaker. The medical class of 1970 Reunion Committee unanimously agreed to invite classmate Dr. Elliot A. Yolas to offer greetings here today. Dr. Yolas is a retired ophthalmologist who practiced in Indianapolis, Indiana for 43 years. Dr. Yolas graduated from the Perlman School of Medicine in 1970, completed his internship at the Indiana University School of Medicine in 1971, and returned to Philadelphia to complete his residency in ophthalmology at Penn in 1974. Dr. Yolas's work focuses on diabetic eye disease. Dr. Yolas has served as a dedicated member of his medical class through his role as class agent for more than 10 years and has volunteered with the host program for many years as well. Thank you for being with us today, Dr. Yolas. Dr. Jameson, distinguished faculty, fellow classmates of 1970, medical school class of 2020, families and friends. To the class of 2020, Congratulations and welcome to membership in the most noble and revered profession in the world, especially now with COVID-19. There is no better calling than helping someone deal with their illness and its surrounding fear, treating them and giving them hope. As representative of the medical class of 1970, I will venture to say that we are really no different than you, although we had less sophisticated and cruder tools at our disposal. To name a few, the microscope. Do you all even know what this is? Each of us in the class of 1970 had to buy one of these, and if I remember right, they were very expensive at around $450, or about $3,000 in today's dollars. I still have mine. We use these to view our mounted histology and hematology slides, etc. You'd undoubtedly have all of this on your computers. A Kodak carousel. Lectures were done with these with the use of 35 millimeter slides with this device. Often the slides would jam during a talk. You have your PowerPoint. 
33 and a third records. We listen to these to learn our heart murmurs. How do you do this now? The PDR, the number of hours we use this thick, yearly updated book to look up side effects and match patients' pills to the color pictures were endless. Now you just Google or ask Siri or Alexa. You graduate well prepared by a wonderful, outstanding faculty. Our class also was fortunate to be taught by illuminates, such as Peter Knoll, Pathology, the Philadelphia Chromosome, Stanley Dudrick, Hyperalimentation, Celso Ramon Garcia, one of my faculty advisors, co-investigator of the pill, Harold Shea, Ophthalmology, who was my chief, just to name a few. I'm sure I left out others that my classmates would love to add. I have no doubt that you will experience revolutionary and amazing advances in medicine and techniques, as did I. Some of you in the class of 2020 will be inventors of these changes. Others will be good at applying them. Others will do both. To give one example from my own specialty ophthalmology, when I just finished residency in 1974, cataract surgery was a two-hour operation. Patients were hospitalized over here at the Shea Institute for 10 days, and after three months of healing, were finally given Coke bottle glasses or hard contact lenses, which they had difficulty handling, just to be able to see. Now cataract surgery takes less than 20 minutes and is done as an outpatient with a two-hour stay. Thanks to this miraculous implant, the patients see quite well almost immediately. You will have up days and down days in medicine. One day you will save a patient's life by diagnosing a brain tumor from simple clinical findings in the office. You will go home that night feeling like a million bucks. The next day in the office, you will find that one of your glaucoma patients unfortunately has lost more vision because the eye pressure was not low enough. You will diagnose a melanoma early and save a life. One day you'll be successful at a difficult delivery, but the next day a baby will be stillborn. But because of your wonderful training and ed dedication, I can guarantee you that you'll have many, many more highs than lows. And you will find that a grateful patient is the best high of all. Also, don't forget that each patient is unique. Despite all the education you've had here at Penn and will obtain elsewhere, and despite all your extra reading and research, the patient's body and mind will do unexplainable things. Emboli will still be thrown despite proper anticoagulation. Or you'll be faced with a situation that will let you not anticoagulate because the patient has another condition. Then what do you do? Or you will do everything right and still the patient will go downhill. Or you will inadvertently make a mistake and the patient will miraculously recover. You will have ongoing challenges. But don't ever lose the idealism and quest for learning that you have today. I can predict that 50 years from now, your representative from the class of 2020 will be giving a similar speech to the graduating class of 2070. They will also say that we went through the dark ages of medicine, but we helped a lot of people along the way. I hope you enjoy the road ahead as much as I did. Go forth into your wonderful profession. Thank you so much, Dr. Yolas. Benjamin Franklin, the founding father of the University of Pennsylvania, is known for many famous quotes. He has said, without continual growth and progress, such words as improvement, achievement, and success have no meaning. Today, we take note of this moment in time even as you plan for continued growth and progress, to recognize and celebrate your achievement and success. This is the moment you have been waiting for. We can affirm that each of you, graduates of 2020, have completed all of the necessary requirements to receive your Doctor of Medicine degree from the Raymond and Ruth Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. So it is now our great pleasure to call each of you by name to recognize your outstanding accomplishments. Dr. John Morris, Associate Dean for Student Affairs, will recognize each graduate. 
As your name is called, we will pause for a moment to celebrate you, view your picture, and your plans for the future with our very best wishes of congratulations. And now we celebrate the achievements of each member of the class of 2020. You will notice in the program that many of these students have already been honored with numerous additional accolades. We have students who are in our combined MD PhD program who have already received their PhD degree and other students who are graduating with additional certifications or degrees. We would also like to acknowledge those students who have been elected to the Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Society and the Arnold P. Gold Humanism Honor Society. I now present to you the class of 2020. Dr. Andrew Mark Acker. Dr. Acker would have been hooded by his father, Dr. Michael Acker, Professor of Surgery and Chief of the Division of Cardiovascular Surgery. Dr. Alexandra Adigoki. Dr. Adigoki is a graduate of the MD-PhD program, earning her PhD in bioengineering. Dr. Pratik Agarwal. Dr. Anjali Agarwala. Dr. Teja Alapetti. Dr. Liz Albert. Dr. Priyanka Anand. Dr. Brian James Abel. Dr. Stephen Baldassano. Dr. Baldassano is a graduate of the MD-PhD program, earning his PhD in bioengineering. He would have been hooded by his father, Dr. Robert Baldassano, professor of pediatrics in the Division of Gastroenterology at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Dr. Vivek Bahara. Dr. Bahara is a graduate of the MD-PhD program, earning his PhD in cell and molecular biology. Dr. Nadir Sinan Biliji. Dr. Hannah Bogan. Dr. Kelly Boylan. Dr. Remy Bremner. Dr. Ming Tsai. Dr. Richard Campbell. Dr. Julia Carney. Dr. Angeles Caro Munrohi. Dr. Alejandro Casalino. Dr. Casalino would have been hooded by his mother, Dr. Maria Okendo, professor and chair of the Department of Psychiatry. Dr. Beta Cha. Dr. Madeline Crystal Chandra. Dr. Gina Chang. Dr. Megan Chenworth. Dr. Daniel Child. Dr. Child is a graduate of the MD-PhD program, earning his PhD in cell and molecular biology. Dr. Amanda Li-Ming Chin. Dr. Steve sung -won Cho. Dr. Caroline W. Chung. 
Dr. Chung would have been hooded by her father, Dr. Chung C. Chung, director of the postdoctoral orthodontic program at the School of Dental Medicine. Dr. Zachariah Cole. Dr. Victor Richard Cotton. Dr. Catherine Elizabeth Cullen. Dr. Nicole Romano Kearns. Dr. Sonia Dave. Dr. Lauren Davis Rivera. Dr. Yang Ding. Dr. Alexandra Domes. Dr. Domes would have been hooded by her father, Dr. Robert Domes, professor and pathologist in chief at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Dr. Alexandra Dreyfus. Dr. Claire Drolin. Dr. Elizabeth Duckworth. Dr. Hannah Elmangi. Dr. El Shaddai Ephraim. Dr. Christine Farrell. Dr. Christopher Gajewski. Dr. Ivana Ganiham. Dr. Nicholas J. Gold. Dr. Drew William Goldberg. Dr. Goldberg would have been hooded by his father, Dr. Richard Shalansky Goldberg, professor of radiology. Dr. Megana Gola. Dr. Sophia Gomez. Dr. Jan Gong. Dr. Austin Lewis Good. Dr. Good is a graduate of the MD-PhD program, earning his PhD in cell and molecular biology. Dr. Kendall Lynn Goodyear. Dr. Justin Edward Grinnett. Dr. Jeremy Grave. Dr. Grave is a graduate of the MD-PhD program, earning his PhD in cell and molecular biology. Dr. Emily Jean Gupp. Dr. Naomi Goodkin. Dr. Jessica Guzman. Dr. Mitchell James Hallman. Dr. Nicholas Henry Hampelos. Dr. Kirlos Nadir Harun. Dr. Elaine Hong Hatch. Dr. Jorge Andres Hernandez. Dr. Marianne Hernando. Dr. Sutton Elizabeth Higgins.
Dr. Crystal Hill. Dr. Sean Hines. Dr. Zachary Michael Hostetler. Dr. Hostetler is a graduate of the MD-PhD program, earning his PhD in cell and molecular biology. Dr. Andrew Huang. Dr. Catherine Elizabeth Trena Hutchison. Dr. Jasmine Huang. Dr. Arvind Jadu. Dr. Olivia Simone Ju. Dr. Cougar Jaramillo. Dr. Lauren Lee Johnson. Dr. Yong Hoon Kim. Dr. Kim is a graduate of the MD-PhD program, earning his PhD in cell and molecular biology. Dr. Lohith Ganesh Kinney. Dr. Kinney is a graduate of the MD-PhD program, earning his PhD in bioengineering. Dr. Rebecca Kocher. Dr. Kevin Kolshresta. Dr. John Blancalis. Dr. Scott Michael Lavalva. Dr. Harrison Tyson Lee. Dr. J. Huan Lee. Dr. Lee is a graduate of the MD-PhD program, earning his PhD in immunology. Dr. Julian Liebman. Dr. John Lee. Dr. Misha Lee. Dr. Lee is a graduate of the MD-PhD program, earning her PhD in cell and molecular biology. Dr. Allison Lieberman. Dr. Lieberman is a graduate of the MD-PhD program, earning her PhD in cell and molecular biology. Dr. Jessica Fong Liu. Dr. Liu is a graduate of the MD-PhD program, earning her PhD in bioengineering. Dr. Jason Liu. Dr. Liu is a graduate of the MD-PhD program, earning his PhD in cell and molecular biology. Dr. Nancy Liu. Dr. Carissa Elaine Livingston. Dr. Megan Lockwood. Dr. Dorothy Elizabeth Loy. Dr. Loy is a graduate of the MD-PhD program, earning her PhD in cell and molecular biology. Dr. Esteban Luna. Dr. Luna is a graduate of the MD-PhD program, earning his PhD in neuroscience. Dr. Ethan Andrew Mack. Dr. Mack is a graduate of the MD-PhD program, earning his PhD in immunology. Dr. Catherine Magoon. Dr. George Malia. Dr. Lauren Mead. Dr. Blake Mergler. Dr. Arie Metzger. Dr. Blake Collins Meza. Dr. Gabrielle Mezachow. 
Dr. Mesichow would have been hooded by her mother, Dr. Emily Blumberg, professor of medicine and radiation oncology. Dr. Catherine Freeman Michael. Dr. Alexandra Smith Miller. Dr. Nicholas Lawrence Moore. Dr. Jennifer Morganroth. Dr. Morganroth would have been hooded by her mother, Dr. Gail Morrison, professor of medicine. Dr. Herdley Moses Murdoch. Dr. Sneha Narasimhan. Dr. Narasimhan is a graduate of the MD-PhD program, earning her PhD in neuroscience. Dr. Natalie Neal. Dr. Alana Nelson Greenberg. Dr. Bianca Nethanoyam. Dr. Joy Ebonolua Obayami. Dr. Oladayo Oshutokun. Dr. Mariah Ousu Ajay. Dr. Ethan Pawnee. Dr. Alomi Parikh. Dr. James Clayton Parker. Dr. Jonathan Peterson. Dr. William Puwinica Worms. Dr. Mark Pfeiffer. Dr. Bo Quinn. Dr. Abhine Ramachandran. Dr. Lauren Reed Guy. Dr. Danielle Corvo Rennie. Dr. Leah Rethi. Dr. Emily Ryder Longmay. Dr. David Roberts. Dr. Maxwell Rogowski. Dr. Rogowski is a graduate of the MD-PhD program, earning his PhD in History and Sociology of Science. Dr. Jacqueline Rosenthal. Dr. Andrew Ruff. Dr. Anik Saha. Dr. Mohima Sanyal. Dr. Daniel Saris. Dr. Saris would have been hooded by his mother, Dr. Ann Hunnebrink, Associate Professor of Clinical Obstetrics and Gynecology. Dr. Stephen Scarfell. Dr. Hannah Lauren Schultz. Dr. Mika Schwartz. Dr. Natty Sergey. Dr. Juan Serna. Dr. Preya Shah. Dr. Shah is a graduate of the MD-PhD program, earning her PhD in bioengineering. Dr. Daniel Sierra Vasquez. Dr. Kara Silberthal. Dr. Silberthal would have been hooded by her mother, Dr. Susan Mandel, professor of medicine and chief of the division of endocrinology, diabetes, and metabolism. 
Dr. Malia Skaljic. Dr. Jillian Louise Smith. Dr. Scott David Simons. Dr. Adedulapo Dali Omehefe Taiwo. Dr. Alan Tang. Dr. Tang is a graduate of the MD PhD program, earning his PhD in pharmacology. Dr. Rebecca Tang. Dr. Shang Tang. Dr. Tang is a graduate of the MD PhD program, earning his PhD in neuroscience. Dr. Elizabeth S. Tepler. Dr. Estefanos Tillahun. Dr. Solimar Torres Maldonado. Dr. Erin Elizabeth Tully. Dr. SNM Ugaji. Dr. Leo Wong. Dr. Wong is a graduate of the MD-PhD program, earning his PhD in bioengineering. Dr. Yixing Ali Wang. Dr. Eric Ward. Dr. Jenny Wei. Dr. DJ Wendler. Dr. Philip Williams. Dr. Christine Willinger. Dr. Vivian Wong. Dr. Ryan Zahoka. Dr. Leah Zuroff. In your graduation program, please note these individuals who have received prizes and awards. I would like to highlight just three of these awards. The Leonard Tao Humanism in Medicine Award presented by the Arnold P. Gold Foundation is awarded to our graduate who displays the highest standards of humanism and professionalism. This year's recipient is Dr. Alexandra Smith Miller. The Nathan and Pauline Pincus Prize is awarded each year for outstanding achievement as a clinician. Please join me in acknowledging this year's recipients. Dr. Alexandra Domes and Dr. John Lee. As your program notes, the Dr. Spencer Morris Prize is awarded each year to the medical student in the graduating class who scores the highest on an oral examination given to selected students based on academic and clinical achievement. It is, without question, the highest academic honor a graduate from the Perlman School of Medicine can receive. I'm delighted this year to present the Dr. Spencer Morris Prize to Dr. Pratik Agarwal. On behalf of the Office of Student Affairs, I would like to take the opportunity to personally congratulate each member of the class of 2020. This is a remarkable achievement. It's been a privilege and pleasure to work with you, and we wish you continued success and all of life's greatest blessings. Congratulations on a job well done. Now please welcome Dr. Jennifer Kogan, Associate Dean for Student Success and Professionalism, who will introduce this year's student speaker. Thank you, Dr. Mars, and congratulations to the class of 2020 on achieving this tremendous milestone. We are so proud of each and every one of you. It has been an honor to get to know you and to work with many of you over the past few years. It is customary each year for a member of the graduating class to address the audience on this momentous occasion. 
It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Alana Nelson-Greenberg, a member of the class of 2020, and someone I've been fortunate to get to know over the past year who was selected for this honor. Be well. Thank you, Dr. Kogan, for the very gracious introduction. Class of 2020, we made it. I'm really excited and grateful to be speaking to you today. And first and foremost, I wanna thank all of Suite 100. For our families and friends, Suite 100 is code for the administrative superheroes because they have moved the world for us throughout all of medical school and especially over these past few extremely strange and uncertain months. You have been our rocks. In particular, I think we're the luckiest class in the world because we're graduating with Helene Weinberg, who is retiring this spring. She has accompanied us, steadied us, and led us through the myriad of mazes that medical school requires. It's not an exaggeration to say that we, and many, many doctors before us, wouldn't have made it without you, or at least we would have hit a lot more dead ends along the way. Thank you, Helene. Critically, I wanna say thank you to the parents, the extended families and friends, and to the found families who have supported and sacrificed for us, not just during medical school, but on the roads to and from wherever we have been and we will go. Thank you to everyone who's packed our brains with knowledge over the years, to the preclinical scientists, attendings, residents, pharmacists. I promise this will only take an hour and a half, so bear with me here to the AV tech wizards, to everyone in the Department of Diversity and Inclusion, to the nurses. Okay, my point here is that we're not alone as we stand here or sit here today. We're here because of every person in the school and in our own lives who have supported us and gotten us to this point. So to all of you, thank you, thank you, thank you. On a personal note, I also want to thank all of you, my classmates, who have so graciously adopted me and so many others into the class of 2020. I want to congratulate us all on actually having made the decision and are on arriving at the moment of graduation. Though in reality, the exact moment for me is mid-April, and I am recording this in a JMX studio. So I'm going to state the obvious. These are truly extraordinary times. We're all trying to make sense of what's going on and how we fit into them. It's hard not to feel helpless, and I've certainly been feeling that way. What's been giving me comfort is remembering that no big thing happens through one big action. Small acts amount to major things, particularly so in the face of enormity. Two examples of this stand out to me, one from medicine and one a little more personal. To start with the more personal, Anyone who knows me knows that I'm an extraordinarily big fan of the Apollo 13 lunar attempt. And as I speak, it's almost 50 years ago to the day that the mission to walk on the moon was aborted by an explosion that threatened the lives of the astronauts on board. Those three astronauts, Jim Lovell, Fred Hayes, and Jack Swaggart, returned home safely because literally hundreds and hundreds of people took thousands and thousands of small steps with just slide rulers as their tools to bring three men home. In an example closer to medicine, we get to remember that we're part of a long, long legacy of people who have done small daily acts in the face of enormity. A generation ago, our predecessors entered internships in the 1980s during the early AIDS epidemic. It was a time when they called it GRID, gay-related immune deficiency. They didn't know what it was and they didn't know how it was transmitted and they watched people their age die really awful and lonely deaths. The people dying were disproportionately gay men and IV drug users, extremely stigmatized and vulnerable populations. Working with clinical providers, community organizers like ACT UP did the daily acts to catalyze policy and treatment changes that transformed AIDS into the treatable chronic disease it is today. We already see the extraordinary disparities in this modern day COVID-19 pandemic. The people most affected by it are still the most vulnerable, and racism, poverty, and other structural forces exacerbate its devastation much further than the biological factor would alone. In the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, the accompanying helplessness that we all feel has been amplified. But in some ways, we graduating today are lucky. We have a role, we have our day to day. Small acts are transformative when we ground them in large values. But what then are those values? Thinking back over my time in medical school, I realized my patients had already started teaching me the answer to that question. 
Taking my cue from a resident, partway through my rotations, I started asking all of my patients the same question. If you could give advice to a young doctor starting out in her training, what would you tell her? I got so many more answers than I'd expect that I swear to God had to do with giving patients hoagies. But universally, the theme that permeated most of the responses centered around kindness. The people in their lives that made the most difference didn't always know the answers, nor did they spend inordinate time with patients. Rather, they were unfailingly kind. What a powerful way to create meaning. I know we know this, we know about kindness, we've had it drilled into us forever. But that doesn't make it a mushy or an unimportant, or perhaps most critically, an easy way to live. It's a theme that George Saunders, the American author, famously discusses in yet another graduation speech. Saunders says, I've spent much of my life in a cloud of things that have tended to push being kind to the periphery. Things like anxiety, fear, insecurity, ambition, the mistaken belief that enough accomplishment will rid me of all of that. Kindness, sure. But first, let me finish this semester, this degree. Let me succeed at this job. And it's a cycle that can go on, well, forever. And Saunders warns us, because we as eternal trainees are extremely vulnerable to this cycle. We're chock full of anxiety, fear, insecurity, and ambition. And in this context, kindness takes immense energy. As trainees, one thing we don't often have is immense energy. Because real kindness requires vulnerability, to be able to stay strong when others question us, and much more commonly when we question ourselves. It requires that when Sandra's cycle inevitably comes calling, we don't give in to meanness, or lean on credentials and titles, or shut others down in order to look more powerful. In a divided, frantic, and objectively scary world, we have to get active and root ourselves in day-to-day -day acts of kindness to everyone. To our patients and colleagues, to our new co-residents and old medical school classmates, and to those people we don't know at all. I think we have to pay special attention to those closest to us who we may sometimes overlook, correctly believing that they'll be forgiving of our neglect. But in order to do this, we need to learn first and foremost to be kind to ourselves. And that requires real work. It requires us to be comfortable with who we are because the more confidence we have, the less likely we are to prove our worth by bullying others. So for myself and for all of us graduating today, I hope we use our energy towards this goal. Oftentimes that may be as simple as leading with curiosity. Curiosity means we're not writing other people's stories for them. And so with better understanding, we may open up rather than wall ourselves off. I hope in turn this curiosity fuels generosity, both towards those we think are more vulnerable than us, and also towards the people who remind us of ourselves and sometimes feel like they threaten us even more. I hope we remember how smart and competent we are at our cores, even if it doesn't always feel that way outwardly and that we don't lash out against others when confidence fails. I hope we've been kind in knowing that there are times when we have and when we will fail, when we'll be too tired to ask for clarification and we'll miss the nuance of what someone is telling us, when we'll snap at colleagues hoping to trick people around us into thinking a mistake was not our own. And yet I hope we know that doing so does not actually make us look stronger and that we stay brave in deciding to embrace all of who we are, as opposed to rejecting others as a shield. I'm gonna end with a quote from one of my favorite authors, Anne Michaels, who says, it's a mistake to think it's the small things we control and not the large. We can't stop the small accident, the tiny detail that conspires into fate, but we can assert the largest order, the large human values daily, the only order large enough to see. I love this quote because, as Michaels reminds us, it is large choices that we make as we live our day to day that will determine who we are and what kinds of doctors we will be. Deciding to come to medical school, understanding that we have willingly entered the pain of others, erring in the direction of kindness, choosing to be decent and empathic will keep us grounded and control what really is in our hands to control. I feel extraordinarily lucky to have you all as my colleagues as we leave this unbelievable institution and start our medical careers. Thank you all, and here's again to our class of 2020. Thank you, Dr. Nelson Greenberg, for your inspirational words. 
I am very pleased to announce Dr. Nadia Bennett, Associate Dean for Undergraduate Medical Education, Clinical and Health System Sciences Curriculum, as the recipient of the Medical Student Government Clinical Teaching Award. Dr. Bennett has been honored with this award from our graduating students. Dr. Bennett will now lead the class of 2020 in the recitation of the Physician's Pledge, the Declaration of Geneva, a modern version of the Hippocratic Oath. At this time, I have the privilege of leading the Declaration of Geneva. I ask the class of 2020 to please rise wherever you are. According to our tradition, I also invite all physicians present in this ceremony to rise to renew their commitment with these newest members of our profession. Wherever you may be, please speak loudly and join me in a recitation of the oath. Let us now read this oath together. As a member of the medical profession, I solemnly pledge to dedicate my life to the service of humanity. The health and well-being of my patient will be my first consideration. I will respect the autonomy and dignity of my patient. I will maintain the utmost respect for human life. I will not permit considerations of age, disease or disability, creed, ethnic origin, gender, nationality, political affiliation, race, sexual orientation, social standing, or any other factor to intervene between my duty and my patient. I will respect the secrets that are confided in me even after the patient has died. I will practice my profession with conscience and dignity and in accordance with good medical practice. I will foster the honor and noble traditions of the medical profession. I will give to my teachers, colleagues, and students the respect and gratitude that is their due. I will share my medical knowledge for the benefit of the patient and the advancement of healthcare. I will attend to my own health, well-being, and abilities in order to provide care of the highest standard. I will not use my medical knowledge to violate human rights and civil liberties, even under threat. I make these promises solemnly, freely, and upon my honor. Thank you. To the graduating class of 2020, as our ceremony comes to a close, I would like to take this opportunity on behalf of all the faculty who have been your teachers, mentors, and friends to express what a privilege it has been to have accompanied you on this journey. We are excited for you and we share in your joy. We are so proud of your achievements and accomplishments and wish you continued success in whatever career path you choose as you begin your next step in your professional careers. To all of your parents, relatives, significant others, and friends, we extend our sincerest congratulations on this very special day for all of you. We acknowledge that these are unprecedented and precarious times, but please know that we feel reassured to know that you are the future of medicine and the scholars, clinicians, and healers that will lead us forward to better times. A thank you to the Watson Highlanders Backpipe Ensemble for providing the music, and to Dr. Katrina Armstrong, our inspirational graduation speaker, Dr. Elliot Yolas, our alumni speaker, and to Dr. Nelson Greenberg, our student speaker. Our sincere gratitude is extended to the individuals in our Office of Academic Programs who coordinated today's events, especially Carrie Renner and Jessica Marcus in the Office of Student Affairs. Our registrar, Helene Weinberg. Helene, we all wish you well in your next endeavors. And our chief operating officer, Anna Delaney, and all of the staff in academic programs. As we conclude today's graduation ceremony, I personally hope that each of you in the class of 2020 finds supreme satisfaction and joy in your medical careers, and that you will always regard the Perlman School of Medicine as your launching pad and home, and that you stay connected with your friends, classmates, teachers, and mentors. Congratulations to all of you. This concludes our commencement exercises celebrating the class of 2020.